Hello, I'm movie man Eric Houston, and I want to thank you for joining me for this look at Hollywood during World War II. Now, we're doing class a little bit differently tonight in an effort to bring you a higher quality presentation. Because of that, I will not be able to answer your questions live during class, but I still really want to encourage you to comment on this video, to like this video, to subscribe to the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel. You can even email me at eric at northmetrotv.com. Your likes and views and comments really help us to be able to keep doing those videos, and we really appreciate it. A quick word about some of the clips that you're going to see in class before we get started. Some of these clips feature nationalist or racist language about America's World War II adversaries. Although unacceptable today, these clips are presented here in their historical context, warts and all. In 1941, as the Second World War continued to rage in Europe, America continued to deliberate. Many felt the war was Europe's problem and, remembering the still fresh scars of World War I, sought to remain neutral. That all changed December 7, 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. With these words, President Franklin Roosevelt galvanized a nation, and America was now at war. But it would be a full year before the Navy would allow the American public to see for themselves footage of the actual attack on Pearl Harbor. Bomb hit caused the Arizona to blow up. The attack was carried out by Jap torpedo planes together with dive bombers and horizontal bombers coming in waves. In a chance hit, a bomb went down a smokestack of the Arizona and exploded the forward magazine. With the stricken vessel, we see the battleships Tennessee and West Virginia hit and on fire. There were eight battleships in the harbor. All were damaged by the bomb and torpedo attack. These breathtaking and heartbreaking images were captured by Fox movie tone cameraman Al Brick. Sensing war on the horizon, Fox dispatched Al to Hawaii earlier in 1941. Al filmed the daily routine of the Navy for months. On December 7th, he was heading into the base to shoot more routine footage when the attack began. Shooting amid the carnage, Al bravely filmed the attack as shrapnel rained down on all sides. Al was later sent to the Pacific, where he filmed the Battle of Midway and many other historical moments. Already sensing the war on the horizon, Hollywood was hard at work on its first wave of war films. The first of these were simple comedies about army life and comedians accidentally enlisting in the war. Abbott and Costello in particular created a sort of cottage industry, appearing in In the Navy, Keep Em Flying, and Buck Privates, which also featured the Andrews sisters and the debut of their popular wartime song, The Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. One of the first films to come out of Hollywood in this era with real teeth was To Be or Not To Be. A farce about a group of Jewish actors posing as Nazis in an attempt to escape German-occupied Poland. The movie was directed by Ernst Lubitsch and starred Jack Benny. Jack had never been particularly lucky with film roles and was not much sought after as a film star, despite his enormous success on the radio. He leapt at the chance to star in To Be or Not To Be after hearing that Lubitsch had written the role for him. It flattered Benny enormously to not only be considered for such a timely and well-written story, but that a prestigious director like Lubitsch actually wanted him. For the female lead, Lubitsch cast Miriam Hopkins in what was to be her comeback role. 
but she and Benny failed to get along on set. Carol Lombard was then cast instead. Lombard was an accomplished screwball comedy actress who had starred in landmark screwball films like My Man Godfrey and Nothing Sacred. Lombard was also part of an early Hollywood power couple, having met Clark Gable on the set of No Man of Her Own. The two became devoted to each other after re-meeting at a Hollywood party and were married in 1939. After an unsuccessful attempt to switch to drama films, as well as time off to raise a family, Lombard in 1941 was determined that her next film be a hit. Lubitsch was Lombard's favorite comedy director, and she also desperately wanted to work for him. She heard of To Be or Not To Be and the troubles it was having finding a female lead, and she put herself up for the role, even though it was a smaller part than she was typically used to. Jack Benny would call To Be or Not To Be the finest film he ever made. And it's recognized as a comedy classic today, although it was largely rejected by audiences of the time many of whom failed to be able to see anything humorous in the very real Nazi threat. Among the audience members who had trouble with To Be or Not To Be was Benny's own father. Benny's father was his biggest supporter, and he never failed to see a Jack Benny film less than six times. But when he went to see To Be or Not To Be and saw his son give the Nazi salute, he stormed out of the theater. Der Führer! Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil myself. That's not in the script. But, Mr. Dobosch, please. That's not in the script, Mr. Brunsky. But it'll get a laugh. But I don't want a laugh here. How many times have I told you not to add any lying? I want... You want my opinion, Mr. Dobosch? No, Mr. Greenberg, I do not want your opinion. All right, let me give you my reaction. A laugh is nothing to be sneezed at. Mr. Green... Jack's father didn't write or call for weeks. Finally, Jack got him on the phone, only to be berated by his father for having played a Nazi in the film. Jack finally convinced him to go back and to see the rest of the movie so that he could see that in reality Jack is fighting the Nazis in To Be or Not To Be. His father relented, went back to the movie, and loved it. And by his own account, saw To Be or Not To Be 46 times. To be or not to be. That is, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, Honor, I'd like to speak to Mrs. Tura alone. Now look, Stanislav, I usually tell my maid when to leave the room. I have so much to tell you. When we're in the plane, we can't talk. When we're in the tea room, we can't do anything but talk. Maria. And when we're in the dressing room, we must be very careful of my makeup. Sadly, To Be or Not To Be was Carol Lombard's final film. Shortly before the release, she returned to her home state of Indiana for a war bond rally. She broke records that night and raised two million dollars. Eager to return home, she skipped her planned train trip and boarded a flight. Early January 16, 1942, that plane crashed into a mountainside outside of Las Vegas. All 22 passengers were killed, including Carol, her mother, and 15 U.S. Army soldiers. Carol had been cast in a movie called They All Kiss the Bride, and filming was about to begin shortly. She was replaced by her friend Joan Crawford, who donated all of her salary to the Red Cross in memory of Carol. The U.S. Navy commissioned the SS Carol Lombard in her honor, launching it on the second anniversary of that record-breaking war bond drive. During the war, it rescued hundreds of survivors from ships sunk in the Pacific. Inconsolable following his wife's death, Clark Gable ultimately decided to enter the war, joining the Air Force in 1942. In her final days, Carol had pestered Gable about doing his part and joining the Air Force, and so he decided this would be a fitting way to honor her. Gable was assigned to create a recruitment film for aerial gunners. He completed bomber training school and flew five bombing missions, including one over Germany. Gable nearly died on that one, when a piece of flak pierced his plane, his boot, and nearly his head. 
he returned to America to edit his film, Combat America, which focused primarily on the gunners he served with. In the meantime, we find Kenny and Phil cleaning their guns in front of the armament shop. Hello, Captain. Hello, fellas. Well, how was it? You know, Captain, I don't think those Germans like us. Are you ready to go again? Sure. You got to get this thing over. But did you learn anything you didn't know before? Plenty. At home, they told us the Germans made most of their attacks on the tail. Today, most of them are on the nose. Yeah. Most of the time, I had my turret pointed at 12 o'clock. I must have fired a thousand rounds. Let's go all these guns, Ken. All set? Yes, check those guns. You had plenty more use for them the next two weeks. Emden, Kiel, Willemshaven, St. Nazaire, Bremen. And every swastika stands for a Hun pilot that asked for it and got it. For his service, Captain Clark Gable was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross the Air Medal, and several more. Adolf Hitler himself considered Gable to be the most valuable of America's fighting actors, and issued a considerable reward to anyone who could capture Gable alive. Gable was hardly the only actor to serve, though. Henry Fonda enlisted in the United States Navy, saying, I don't want to be in a fake war in a studio. David Niven returned to his native England to rejoin the army and saw action during the invasion of Normandy. Ultimately, 25% of the male film industry would serve in the armed forces, and the first big star to commit was Jimmy Stewart. Both of Stewart's grandfathers served in the Civil War, and his father served in the Spanish-American War and World War I. An experienced pilot, he enlisted in the Air Corps in March of 1941. He made numerous PR appearances for the Air Corps, including on the radio with Charlie McCarthy and in a recruitment film called Winning Your Wings. This film alone was supposedly responsible for engaging some 150,000 new recruits and was nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary. So whether you're flying a plane as a pilot or a co-pilot, charting its course as a navigator, acting as bombardier, or in any one of the many technical jobs in the air or on the ground, wherever it is in the United States Army Air Forces, you're part of a team. Now remember that. So listen to the roar of those motors, young men of America, and heed their call. Soon the skies will be filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own... Tired of sitting out the war in PR missions, Stuart appealed to his commander and was dispatched to England to pilot a B-24 Liberator flying many missions. In his later years, Stewart was often reluctant to discuss his time serving the nation. However, he did share some of his memories in this BBC documentary. Well, the fighter, he was the boogeyman. Uh, the fighter had eyes, and uh, in a great many instances, uh, the fighter had a pretty confident fella uh, at the controls. And when he latched onto you, uh, you, you, were in, you were in trouble lots of time. In just four years, Stewart was awarded the rank of Colonel and received a number of medals. He continued his affiliation with the Army Air Reserves after World War II and was ultimately promoted to Brigadier General in 1959, making him the highest ranking actor to have ever served in the American military. Back at home, many other actors did what they could, appearing in posters, running scrap drives, war bond drives, and appearing in educational films. One actor with a more important role to play was Veronica Lake. Famous for her peekaboo hairstyle, many of the women now entering work in factories wore their hair like Lake's, but the long hair was getting caught in the machinery, injuring the women. The government asks Lake to cut her hair, and she does, but at the ultimate cost of her career. Without those long locks to the American public, she simply wasn't Veronica Lake. Betty Davis, like many actors, started out selling war bonds and was very successful at it. Betty was friends with a number of performers and helped them too whenever she could. Among them was John Garfield. Garfield had tried to join the army but was declared 4F thanks to his heart. 
He and Betty began to concoct an idea for a special servicemen's club that would be staffed by Hollywood's best and brightest, and converted an old stable into the Hollywood Canteen, a special restaurant, theater, and social club that catered exclusively to the men and women of America's armed forces. The only entry fee was your uniform, and once inside, servicemen were waited on by the biggest stars in the business, not just acting as entertainment, but as waiters, bartenders, cooks, and dishwashers. With many of Hollywood's most glamorous leading ladies dancing the night away with men in uniform. The Hollywood canteen quickly became famous as an oasis of glamour and a welcome last stop for many servicemen who were being shipped out to the Pacific in an uncertain future. What would you like to see next? Beautiful women. Davis worked tirelessly at the canteen, personally assuring big-name stars would be in attendance every night. Opening night was the only night the general public was allowed at the canteen. They could sit in bleachers for a hundred dollars a head and watch the celebrity volunteers parade through. The event was so successful and so crowded that Betty Davis had to enter through a window that night. By the end of the war, the Hollywood canteen had served nearly four million service people, including distributing three million packs of cigarettes, six million pieces of cake, 125,000 gallons of milk, and 9 million cups of coffee. Davis was awarded the Distinguished Civilian Service Medal for her work. She later said, There are very few accomplishments in my life that I am sincerely proud of. The Hollywood Canteen is one of them. One of the most frequent volunteers at the canteen was Bob Hope. Eager to perform for even more service people, Hope took his act on the road and performed in front of the service people at March Field in California. Not long after, he left for Europe, traveling hundreds of miles by jeep to entertain our armed forces wherever they were stationed. He logged an additional 30,000 miles in the South Pacific, and of the 144 episodes of his radio show released during the war, only nine were recorded in the studio. The rest were all recorded in front of the troops. This is Bob Mosquito Network Hope. Well, here we are on this beautiful, romantic South Pacific island. Boy, aren't these islands pretty? Wait till I see that Dorothy Lamour. What a lie. <laughs> but I really hope you enjoy our show today. We have a nice show here with Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna, Tony Romano, Patty Thomas, and Barney Dean. I know you'll enjoy the girls. You remember girls? Author John Steinbeck, who was working at the time as a war correspondent, said, when the time for recognition to the nation in wartime comes to be considered, Bob Hope should be high on the list. This man drives himself and is driven. It is impossible to see how he can do so much, can cover so much ground, can work so hard, and can be so effective. He works month after month at a pace that would kill most people. One general was so impressed by Hope's impact on the morale of the enlisted men that he said Hope's importance to the Army was equal to an entire division of 150,000 men. Hope would continue to perform in USO shows for 50 years, entertaining troops around the world. An act of Congress would name him an honorary veteran in 1997. It was one of the proudest moments of Hope's life. Another of the great wartime performers was Marlena Dietrich. Marlena started out as an actress in Germany before emigrating to the United States in 1930, well before the rise of the Nazi party. Dietrich hated Hitler, though, and detested his treatment of the Jewish people, and in 1931 renounced her German citizenship and became an American, infuriating the Nazis. 
Along with director Billy Wilder, she created a fund to help Jews and others escape Nazi Germany, contributing her entire salary of $450,000 for the film Night Without Armor to the cause. She too began selling war bonds and was reported to have sold more bonds than any other motion picture star. From 1942 to 1943, she toured America, rejecting the stage speeches written for her in advance in favor of more suggestive speeches that she wrote for herself. Well, men, the cop of the night beat will be coming along in a second, and if he finds our lights on, he'll have to make an investigation. So we'll ring down the curtain on another command performance for all of you men and women who will be ringing down the curtain on the axis. Of course, the G.I.s loved her. She performed in theaters, visited hospitals, and sang for more than 250,000 soldiers on the West Coast alone. She then left for North Africa, where she entertained another 150,000 in 68 performances before moving on to Europe, and her first performance in Berlin since she had left all those years ago. Go see what the boys in the back room will have and tell them I'm having the same. Go see what the boys in the back room will have and give them the poison they name. And when I die, don't spend my money on flowers in my picture in a frame. Just see what the boys in the back room will have and tell them my side. And tell them I cry. While the American soldiers continued to adore her, the German people met her with suspicion and slander. Still, this return trip to Berlin would prove to be one of the happiest moments in Marlena's life. In the build-up to World War II, Hitler contacted Marlena numerous times, ordering her back to Germany. When Marlena refused, Hitler threatened her mother. Marlena worried about her mother for the next several years, particularly when she got word from her sister that, despite the increased scrutiny, their mother was harboring her Jewish friends in her home, hiding them from the Nazis. During that return trip to Berlin in September of 1945, American soldiers located Marlena's mother and reunited them. It was the first time they had seen each other in 13 years. For her service, Marlena was awarded the Medal of Freedom. And it wasn't just actors. Directors and cinematographers joined the war effort, too. Among them, director John Huston. Huston made three films for the U.S. Army during the war, but all of them were censored or outright banned by the Army, who felt they were pacifist pictures because of their unflinching reality. Huston countered that he made them in profound admiration for the courage of the American soldier. The Battle of San Pedro depicted a disastrous mission. That is the broad shape of the Battle of San Pietro, which was but the first of many battles in the Erie Valley. It was a very costly battle. After the battle, the 143rd Infantry Regiment alone required 1,100 replacements. The lives lost were precious lives to their country, to their loved ones, and to the men themselves. Another film, Let There Be Light, centered on American soldiers suffering from what would later be called PTSD. During a time, I got worried that my brother, he was killed on a canal. Oh, the Marine? Yes. Yeah. Now, I notice in this uh, history here that you saw a vision of your brother. What, uh, tell me something about that. What, what happened? Oh, I, I guess it was a dream. Well, describe the dream. What, what did you see in the dream? I, I dreamt that I was home. My brother was home. My other brother was home. We all were home. All of you were home? Sitting around the table. Everybody was happy, and we were laughing, you know, talking, mm -hmm. just admiring each other. I mean, 
and then it ended there. You okay. can see these images clearly. Yeah, it was like in that dream, she. Yeah. No. Uh, what about this Mindanao thing uh, you're telling me about? Well, I, in Mindanao, after I got that movie, I, I, I was, I mean, I was scared. You were scared. I, I don't know. I sometimes I, I hope something would happen. Then again, I say, well, something did happen. What do you mean by something happened? You mean you were hoping that you'd be wounded and sent back? Is that what you mean? No. What do you mean by that? I meant that I, I hope that. I just, you know, I was so disgusted and tired of everything. I just didn't feel like living. And then I changed my mind and I think back to my folks. And it'd be a double blow if something happened to me. And I'd be standing guard, sitting on a machine gun there, just watching. And I'd, I'd hear a little noise and I'd let go and shoot. And it wasn't nothing, probably was an animal or something. Any noise made you upset and you just shoot? At that time, yes. That film was considered so damaging that the Army blocked its release until 1981. Frank Capra, director of movies like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and later It's a Wonderful Life, joined the Army too and was now a major. When he was called in to see U.S. Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall and was ordered to produce a series of films explaining to the newly enlisted men why America had entered the war, as many still weren't entirely sure. Capra was nervous. He'd never made a documentary before and wasn't sure that he could create as polished a piece of filmmaking as Laney Riefenstahl's legendary propaganda film The Triumph of the Will, which portrayed the Nazi army as enormous and unstoppable. Capra said of the picture, Satan couldn't have devised a more blood-chilling super spectacle. As a psychological weapon aimed at destroying the will to resist, it was just lethal. When Capra began making his first films for the army, he became inspired by the quote from the Bible, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He took footage from the Nazis' films and from their allies, recutting it and recontextualizing it, and so allowing the Nazis' own words and images and actions to make the case that they had to be stopped. On March the 12th, 1938, without warning, the German armies marched over the Austrian border. It was really only a full-scale invasion test, and Hitler rode in triumph into Vienna. Even the very name of Austria disappeared from the map, though Hitler had promised earlier to the world the assertion that it is the intention of the German Reich to coerce the Austrian state is absurd. Capra would make 11 films in all, mostly under the Why We Fight banner. These films were shown not only to American soldiers, but to American citizens, because they were so powerful and successful in their ability to state exactly why this war and its sacrifices were so necessary. The films were redubbed in French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese, and Winston Churchill ordered all of them shown to the British public. The animated maps in these films were created by Walt Disney Studios. Half of Disney's Burbank Studios had been requisitioned by the Army following Pearl Harbor. Despite losing their studio, Walt and his staff wholeheartedly supported the war effort, with more than 90% of their output now dedicated to the United States government creating pamphlets, designing insignia, and making films that entertained and instructed. A favorite star of these films was Donald Duck, who appeared in the film Der Führer's Face, which won an Oscar for its portrayal of Donald's Nazi nightmare. <laughs> Stretch of America. 
Not to love the poor is a great disgrace. So be high, high, right in the poor's face. So be high, high, right in the poor's face. While all of this work was provided for free or at cost, Disney reaped huge benefits from forever tying his characters to images of America and patriotism. Sometime in 1942, Frank Capra approached the Disney Studios about creating a series of animated films about a new character named Private Snafu. These would be educational films for soldiers that would provide instruction through an inept character who always did the wrong thing and suffered the consequences. Disney agreed to produce the films, but he wanted to retain all rights to the Private Snafu character and merchandising of the character. Capra began to shop the idea around, and ultimately Warner Brothers won the contract, underbidding Disney by 60% and eschewing the demands for character rights. The Snafu films would be made by a real who's who of Warner Brothers' top talent, including Chuck Jones, Frizz Freeling, and Bob Clampett directing. Mel Blanc, the voice of Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, and dozens of others, would voice Snafu and most of the other characters. Scripts would be by future children's authors Philip D. Eastman, Munro Leaf, and Theodore Giesel, who would later call himself Dr. Seuss. These films were considered top secret and were never intended to be shown to the public. As such, they could be a little more crass and a little more racy than the average Warner Brothers cartoon. It's a sense to keep a secret if a fella just takes care. He's sailing on a troop ship now. we got to find out where. I'm a sound and silent soldier, just as steady as a rock. Here's to my little secret with its chain and pattern lock. While all of that was going on under the umbrella of the Army, the Air Force was also having success under the umbrella of the so-called First Motion Picture Unit. We've already seen some of these films, but probably the most famous is called Memphis Bell, A Story of a Flying Fortress. Directed by William Wyler, who would direct the movies Wuthering Heights, Ben-Hur, and Funny Girl, the film chronicles a day in the life of a B-17 bomber crew as they complete their 25th bombing run. A historical mission, as the Bell was the first B-17 to survive that many missions. Wyler chose the Memphis Bell and her crew because he felt the name had a certain mystique, and because of the reputation of the captain, Robert Morgan, who could put Wyler, as he himself said, in the center of the action with a pretty good chance of coming back. Wyler and his crew filmed on board the Memphis Bell and a few other planes in its formation on a number of missions and regularly encountered heavy enemy fire. Cinematographer Harold Tenenbaum was on board one of the other B-17s during a bombing run over France. That B-17 was shot down and Tenenbaum lost his life, underscoring the dangers not just faced by the film crew, but especially by those bomber pilots who flew missions on the B-17s again and again and again. The first flak, just harmless looking silent puffs of smoke. Only each puff is a shell exploding, throwing shrapnel around the sky. Exactly the range, accurate flak by radio prediction. Five miles down, Nazi anti-aircraft batteries have calculated the altitude, speed, and course. Where will the next one hit? You try not to be there.
the docks and submarine pens of Wilhelmshaven. Approach to the target starts. No smoke screen can protect it. Now the enemy knows the path of your approach and walls that path with a flak barrage. But you fly right through it. Flak so thick you can get out and walk on it. Morgan changes course every 15 seconds. Evasive action to confuse the flak batteries. Bomb sights set for correct altitude and speed. Bomb bay doors open. The bombing run begins. Pilot to Bombardier. OK, Vin, you've got it. Now Evans flies the Memphis Bell, controlling it through the bomb site. And now we are most vulnerable. Committed to our bombing run, we can't dodge flak or fighters. Here's the first. at it. Evans must ignore the battle. Crosshairs lined up on target. Adjustments for wind drift made. Two more fighters diving from nine o'clock. Flak now has the range two. They've hit this fort, but he keeps on his bombing run. As lead bombardier, Evans' aim must be good. Every other ship in the group will drop its bombs when he drops his. Now one pointer on the bomb site moves toward another stationary pointer. The instant they touch, bombs will release. Touch. Bombs away. After her 25th mission, the crew flew the Memphis Bell back to the United States as part of a war bond drive. Once home, the crew met with Weiler again, this time to record the soundtrack for the film. It was simply too loud on board the Memphis Bell to record any sort of usable audio. So, once stateside, Weiler reunited the crew and had them simply ad-lib the sort of things they would have said to each other during a bombing run as they watched the film play out before them on a screen. The finished film proved to be a particularly memorable one, perfectly presenting these dangers to the American people. The Memphis Belle herself has been restored and is currently on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. As interesting as the stories of these actors, directors, and celebrities may be, let us never forget the many, many more everyday American men and women who gave their lives or suffered serious injury defending our freedoms. One such man was Harold Russell. Harold lived an unremarkable life in Massachusetts, working in a grocery store. Like a lot of young men, he ran out to enlist after the attack on Pearl Harbor, moved by Roosevelt's Day of Infamy speech. He became a paratrooper and an explosives expert. In 1944, a defective fuse caused the dynamite he was holding to explode in his hands, and both arms had to be amputated below the elbow. Russell rejected a pair of plastic hands in favor of a set of new mechanical hooks. He liked the challenge of learning to make them work and undertook the daily grind needed to master them. His story was featured in a wartime documentary called Diary of a Sergeant. When I came back to the ward, I couldn't help flashing my new hooks. I sure felt cocky. I puffed casually on a cigarette and swaggered as though I'd won the Medal of Honor with Oak Leaf Cluster. I wanted to drink a toast to the world with my own new hands, even if it had to be milk. Boy, was I riding high. No straw for me. It was like catching one in the belly. Maybe the doc's schedule was right. Mine was a lot of optimistic hooey. Instead of trying to run before I could crawl, I started off from scratch, practicing every chance I got. I had to keep adjusting the hooks to find out the best angle and tension for different jobs. I had to develop new muscles and a whole new sense in place of the sense of touch that I'd lost. 
For instance, it seemed unnatural to have to move my left shoulder if I wanted to do something with my right hand. I began to think of it as a sort of remote control, like looking in a submarine periscope to see something up on top. After a few days and nights, it came more easily, but I wouldn't be satisfied until I could do it automatically without having to tell myself, left hand, right shoulder, right hand, left shoulder, every time I took a pencil or a box of matches. It was slow, dull work, and it was hard. There's no sense pretending it wasn't. But one thing I knew, it wouldn't do any good to cry over a bottle of spilt milk. Things were better in the orthopedic workshop where they dressed up teaching to make it more like a game. The checkers were different shapes and weights, and I didn't win often because the nurse could figure out her next three moves while I was making one. The diary of a sergeant was seen by William Wyler, who you'll recall had directed Memphis Bell. Wyler was now hard at work on a new film, The Best Years of Our Lives, a drama about veterans returning home from the war. And while that sort of thing had been done before, this film would focus on soldiers who had suffered psychological and physical traumas. The cast included Frederick March, Dana Andrews, and Myrna Loy. When he saw Diary of a Sergeant, Wyler changed the script to include an amputee character and approached Harold about taking the role. Harold refused, nervous that his inexperience would show on the camera. Still, Wyler persisted, asking Harold again and again until Harold ultimately agreed. The result was a film where the reality of the war intersected with the Dream Factory in this one magical moment and in one utterly distinctive performance. I've learned how to take this harness off. I can wiggle into my pajama top. I'm lucky I have my elbows. Some of the boys don't, but I can't button them up. I'll do that, Homer. This is when I know I'm helpless. My hands are down there on the bed. I can't put them on again without calling to somebody for help. I can't smoke a cigarette or read a book. If that door should blow shut, I can't open it and get out of this room. I was dependent as a baby that doesn't know how to get anything except cry for it. Well, now you know, Wilma. Now you have an idea of what it is. I guess you don't know what to say. It's all right. Go on home. Go away like your family said. I know what to say, Homer. I love you. And I'm never going to leave you. Never. you I loved you. I love you, Wilma. I always have it, and I always will. The Best Years of Our Lives would be one of the most popular films of 1946, and remains one of the top 100 grossing American films. It is also on the American Film Institute's list of the hundred greatest American movies ever made. The film won numerous Oscars, including Best Picture, and Harold Russell was even nominated for Best Supporting Actor. 
a remarkable feat for someone with absolutely no acting experience. Unfortunately, Harold would be up against a real murderer's row of Hollywood talent that year, with his fellow nominees being Charles Coburn, William Demarest, Claude Rains, and Clifton Webb. There was simply no way that Harold was going to be able to beat out those established Hollywood veterans to win an Oscar. But the Academy still very much wanted to honor Harold, and so presented him that night with an honorary Academy Award for bringing hope and courage to his fellow veterans through his appearance. As far as the Academy was concerned, that then, that special Oscar, would be Harold's reward. Imagine their surprise and the audience's surprise then, when the Best Supporting Actor envelope was opened and Harold's name was read. To this day, Harold Russell is the only actor ever to have won two Oscars for the same performance. It was a fitting and memorable tribute to Russell and only the tip of the iceberg of the remembrance deserved not just by the people we've talked about today, but by all the men and women, fighters and otherwise, both those on the front lines and those who stayed home, and of the enormous debt we owe all of them for turning back the tide of war. I want to thank everyone for joining me tonight for this look at Hollywood during World War II. Please comment, like this video, and subscribe to the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel. You can also email your comments to me at eric at northmetrotv.com. The more comments and likes and subscribers we get, the easier it is for us to continue doing these classes for you. And if you live in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area, you'll want to join our email list by emailing me at that same address so that you can find out when we're able to start offering classes again live and in person. I miss doing those classes in person very much and I'm eager to get back to doing them when it's once again safe to do so. Thank you again for joining me and please stay safe.